Okay, uh, this is Sen Seren. He's a um, postdoc researcher at UMass under uh, Professor Hong Yu, and uh, he got his uh, PhD recently from uh, Chungbuk National University in South Korea. Um, he's done a lot of very cool work in uh, deep learning for NLP and uh, biomedical uh, type NLP text extraction, and uh, he's going to talk about some of that right now. All right, thank you. So, hello everyone. I think I will just jump to my presentation. Thanks for coming up for the talk. So this talk is about building a machine that can learn to reason and understand and learn as well by itself. So this talk is going to cover some of the recent our papers that we published. So I have divided the talk in three parts. Uh, first part is about neural semantic encoders. Uh, it's about, it, we will focus on language understanding and reasoning. The second part is on meta learning or learning to learn. And finally, I will give uh, some thoughts on my future research direction and plan. So, what's an encoder in NLP? Or what's the, uh, why do we need encoder in NLP? So, we know that most natural language processing and understanding tasks in the world of this takes the encoding step, which the goal is to encode or transform the symbolic strings into vectors so that they can be used in downstream tasks. We have this uh, sequential neural encoder, which is like RNN or LSTMs with attention. And we have these recursive neural networks based on the output of parser. So neural semantic encoder is basically memory enhanced encoder, which models multi-scale dependency and composition. It's sequential and recursive. You basically learn to compose input sentence depending on the task at hand in, a, in an end-to-end -end fashion. So why do we need external memory in neural networks? We, need, we, we know that we, our brain has different types of memory, long, shorter memory, active or assertive memory. For example, uh, uh, we have this associative idea trigger process in our brain. For example, when we hear like word, for example, day, it will automatically trigger some of the concepts that are related to day, for example, night, whatever. But this is how like assertive memory works in our brain. But then, External memory in the neural network can provide additional storage. It can act as fast or slow weights. It can encode the knowledge or representations so that it will help us to acquire pastoral knowledge for a specific problem. Uh, the most basic uh, uh, memory augmented neural network architecture is uh, RNN search, developed in context of machine translation. It basically stores the source source sentence information in memory, and then when generating the target sentence, it accesses the memory and uses it. Uh, memory, memory networks are kind of memory architecture equipped with read-only memory. It implements this multi-hop read and read operation. Since, we, since this architecture only reads the memory and does not operate a writing, doesn't do writing, it can work with large amount of memory as well. So they applied it to several NLP tasks, for example, question answering, language modeling, and so on. And they also studied different uh, representations for the memory, for example, key value memory. A neural Turing machine is, I think, probably the most sophisticated architecture uh, currently. It has a single controller, which is LSTM or MLP. It has fixed size, fixed memory in terms of the size, the size is fixed, and the memory access is down with soft and hard tension. In order to update the memory, it emits these read, raise, add weights separately, and address uh, programming tasks like copying and sorting and so on. So uh, one of the observation is that neural tree machine is not easy to train or scale. Actually, the training is not stable uh, because I think it's uh, what we see is that it is related to this uh, memory manipulation overhead. 
particularly the controller emits the separate weights for read uh, and writing. So unless the controller is smart enough to track what's written in the past or what's read in the, in the past, it will be basically all writing the useful information in the memory. So there is this uh, memory collision, information collision there. And the first uh, version of this model has no memory D allocation or allocation control in it. So, we, the, so that's why it's kind of not stable. So here I compared NTM with NSE. NSE is the one our, 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 our contribution. So NSE has this uh, modular approach. We have read, compose, and write models. And the memory is no longer fixed in NEC. NEC is flexible. NS memory is flexible. It can shrink or enlarge depending on the input uh, size or input length. Uh, it, it only uses soft attention. And in order to update the memory, it emits only single key vector, uh, which guarantees that there is no information collision. We address uh, multiple language understanding tasks. And we observed this is true to train scale. And we also studied different variations of NSC. There are also different uh, memory augmented neural networks developed so far. But the most of the previous effort focused on uh, programming tasks. So the question here asked is, like, is language understanding programmable? Can we write a code to do sentiment analysis, like we do sorting? Uh, so that's a question, but then in language, particularly we have this semantic, which is kind of difficult to represent or elaborate in, in the task. So this is the overview of uh, neurosemantic encoders. So NEC has this, oops, uh, sorry, four different components, external memory, read, compose, and write models. External memory is organized into slots, each slot uh, represents the, uh, contains the information about input word. So every time step, we read the input word, and we read model takes, it, takes in the input word and uh, retrieves its related slot from the memory using the soft attention mechanism. And those slot and the inputs are passed to compose model Compose model persists them together and gives this persistent information to write model. Write model writes the information back to the same location that the slot was retrieved. So we have this key vector sharing here. Key vector Z is uh, produced or emitted only once and used twice for both reading and writing. So it's very efficient in terms of competition, competition efficient. Yep. So those uh, six equations basically define how NSE works. It's just simple as it is. And we, uh, NSE have different type of relations. We do explore different relations of NSE. For example, we have this multiple memory access where uh, NSE models access to set of different memories. Oh, excuse me, Yep, it's, uh, it depends on how you define long term, I think. Yeah, it's okay. like. The shared across instance. Not shared across instance. Like, like, I will show some examples so we can define. It's not like shared through whole life or like the life of the material. It's uh, initialized every time step. I mean, ev for every example. For, for every example. Yep. So uh, we have this uh, shared memory. This is different than what you define shared, I think. So, uh, so we have this set of NEC models accessing to a single memory, so that we are basically forcing the NECs to share representation, share information using the memory. It's going to be useful for some tasks. And we have this uh, hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical or staked NEC. This architecture is kind of useful for document modeling task or, or character level language processing. So those uh, lower level analysis operate on, on sentence, for example, and providing the higher sentence representation to the higher level memory uh, NEC. The higher level NEC constructs the document representation so that it can be applied to like 
sentiment, document classification or document summarization tasks. So, uh, yeah, we applied NEC to six different tasks, including, including language comprehension. Our, our first task is on sentence classification, or, or just the sentence classification. Yeah, sentiment, sentence leaves sentiment analysis. Here, NEC takes the sentence and output outputs this uh, sentence encoding vector, which is fed to the MLP for classification. We benchmark the model on Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank dataset. So uh, we improve the previous result by up to one percentage of accuracy on this simple task. The next task is answer sentence selection. Here the goal is to select the correct answer from a set of candidate answers for a question. We used WikiQA dataset. And the architecture we use is uh, shared memory architecture. First, uh, NSC encodes answer and it outputs the encoding vector as well as the memory, which contains the information about the answer. And then second, the NSC encodes the question. It also access to the shared memory over here, answer memory over here. So uh, with this architecture, we slightly improved the previous result. We got a slight improvement. It's not, not huge, but still shown effective. And the third task is language inference task. Here the goal is to classify a relationship between two sentences, like if they entail each other or they contradict or they neutral in, in terms of semantic, semantically. Uh, and we studied three different operations of NSC. First one is just the basic NSCs, NSC architecture. The NSC encodes the two sentences simultaneously and gives us this representation. For these, for these models, what are you using? Are you just using the final hidden state as the vector? Yeah, that's, that's the encoding vector. That's the representation for the input sentence. Or the input vector. And, uh, yep. and the second method is shared. So we share the, share the first uh, sentence representation, or first sentence memory with the second sentence or hypothesis. And then we also connect them with attention. So now it attends over the hidden state in addition to the memory. So one more connection there. So this step summarizes the result. The first one is a handcrafted feature. I think it's, it's a max entropic atmosphere, I think. Yeah. Uh, with uh, feature engineering. And next one is based on sentence encoding. This one based on attention. So even the basic NAC outperforms the fine-grained attention-based LSTM by one percentage accuracy here. And if we, if we add attention over there, we got like almost two percentage from, yes? Breakdown of these numbers by the subtask as to whether it's entailment contradiction and neutral because I'd be interested in your results for contradiction especially. Uh, I think yeah, unfortunately I did not do that fine grain. Mm -hmm. I think but I think I could have it like easily. Do you know how many examples in the test set you're you're changing? Uh, how many examples? Of my how many um, answers are you giving differently from these baselines? Is it, is it a lot of different changes across the board, uh, or are you just changing like 10 out of 100 of the, because the numbers would, would differ? Yeah. Uh, I did not look into that, like that, that detailed analysis, but that's interesting to look at this, yeah. So for the document modeling, uh, we did document level sentiment analysis or document classification simply. Uh, so we applied a hierarchical NSC or staked NSCs here. And we also did staked LSTM and NSCs over here. Uh, the datasets we used are Yelp and IMB datasets. datasets. It contains more than 300,000 documents. Uh, so, Overall, our NSC models improved the previous result by up to 
3% of accuracy. But the stacked NEC ALS team performed slightly better than NEC NEC on Yelp dataset. NEC NEC performed slightly better than IMDB. So the thing is that if you look at the statistics, IMDB dataset is kind of longer in terms of number of sentence. And it's kind of difficult, sorry. It's kind of difficult because it contains uh, 10 class. So which could be the reason, but the difference is rather slight. So it's hard to make a conclusion here. And we also conducted a small uh, experiment on machine translation. We compared three different baseline models. First one is RN in search or LSTM with attention model. Second one is NAC with uh, NAC encoder, LSTM decoder. So because since it's LSTM, it doesn't access to the memory. So we only have the source site memory here. But next one is NAC and NAC, which has the shared memory. So the target sentence memory is shared for the NAC, decoder NAC as well. So the, when we share the memory, uh, we get overall like almost a one blue percentage, one, one blue improvement for machine translation. Okay, so the last task is about language comprehension. So the goal is to find an answer uh, for, uh, for a question about the document after reading. So I mean, we have to read the document, we have to answer the question about that document. It's also called closed type question answering. We focused on two datasets, CB test, which comes from children book, WDW, or who did what. It comes from newsware domain. Uh, so uh, we proposed uh, this kind of iterative reading uh, method. We called it comp computational hypothesis testing. So the idea is to formulate or come up with hypothesis for the correct answer in every iteration. So uh, until we reach the right answer, we basically formulate or refine the previous hypothesis by, by modifying the query or modifying the question. So once the model thinks the answer is found, it halts the iteration. So most of the previous models basically summarize the query into a single vector. But instead of doing that, we take different approach, we don't want to summarize the query, but we want to store it in the memory so that we will have the all the information in hand. And we modify or reverse it towards the completion since it's closed type. So we want to find the correct substituting words in the query. Sorry, how, how do you determine when to stop? When to stop? I'm going, to, that's going to be described in the next slides. Yeah, I think, yeah. So we, Proposed two different NEC based models, NEC query getting, NEC adoptive computation. They differ in how the halting is implemented, how the stop is implemented. So, NEC query getting model is shown here. So, basically, the read, compose, and write, and the memory is over here. This is a query memory, and this is document memory. So, we want to erase the query memory towards the completion in order to find the right answer. We, in order to do that, we pick up some uh, words from or, or f some information from the document memory and move it to the query memory. And then every time step, we do gating, implement gating mechanism in order to prevent the our component prediction or, yeah, in order to prevent the our component. We don't want to overwrite whole query information like in the, when we are modifying the query. So this, is, this is one kind of healthy mechanism because until the last iteration, we could basically get the whole query information back to the last step. So, oops. So this is how it's implemented. Why, why is this implemented? What's the task? You're trying to generate a query? Uh, the task is find the right answer uh, for a question. From a, from a list? Uh, yeah, from, from list. Yeah, kind of, because uh, this uh, language comprehension problem is like, read the document, and find the right answer for, for the question, but the answer is in the document. So our answer is in the document. And we also given candidate lists. 
Okay, so it's, it's and what is the refinement? Why is there a refinement step and not just predicting directly predicting from the list? So uh, people already done that, like people implemented one step reading, just read the document one and read the document query once and come up with the answer. But we want to recheck it, like iteratively read, because some, in some cases, document information could be like complex. Like, okay, so sometimes you're effectively you're feeding, in the, you're feeding in the potential answer at the beginning so that the model can encode it conditioned on what it thinks the answer might be. So it can, you get a richer encoding of the document since it's actually encoding the, the input. Yeah. And so those are the, all the standard NSE <coughs> questions. So this is uh, how getting implemented. So uh, actually, we have these two, two types of memory update over here, query memory update. We update the query with the information from the document. We also update the query back uh, using this uh, getting vector. So the gate uh, determines when to stop. Yeah. So the S is the hidden state, which is supposed to encode information both from query and not. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So ideally, if the gate says it's time to produce the answer, that means that all the answer is captured in the in the state in the, in the S. Right? Uh, the gate uh, is on top of W W. I think it's right. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, S. Yeah, true. It's over here. So that means uh, if the gate uh, stop, then the right uh, operator will just write the answer based on the, on the state. Mm -hmm. So you are basically ranking the, the the candidate answers several times until you're pretty sure that the, the yeah, top one. So, is the yeah. Answer. Yeah, and then whenever uh, the read model thinks that the right answer is already encoded in S, then the read model basically close the gate so that no longer the memory update is performed. What are the parameters of the gate? The gate is, uh, is, is parameterized by... Parameters by right model. This right. is LSTM. I see. Then the training is based on the supervised learning. Yeah. Training to uh, the we don't care which one to get or where to read from, but the actual last training signal comes from the, the final, final output. That's a bit tricky. Yeah, in the training process, for different questions, you may have different steps. Huh? Yeah, different. Yeah. But are, when, when you say, are you saying that the gating is explicitly? Done by, is, it, is it explicitly checked by the model to say this is going to stop? Or are you giving an intuitive explanation of what you think is happening inside of the model? Like, do you actually check the gate value and say, okay, I'm going to stop now? Like, as a, as a discrete, explicit thing? Or is, it just, is that just your intu intuition on what's happening? It's my intuition. Okay. It's, it's, I don't make any these hard decisions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you were talking about training and you know, that. I'm, I'm still a little bit confused about how, how, how do you dynamically uh, identify the, 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 the steps uh, using the supervised learning. So uh, the idea is that uh, this gating model is supposed to pass out the all information until the last step in the, of the loop. So in this model, like this query gating model, I don't make it in the hard stuff based on gate value. But even in the test time, I just run it until the last step. And you run it for all queries? Or for, for, wait, for all, you just run it for all queries and take the highest scoring one? Is it, <coughs> like how, how do you actually score a query with this model? Like where is the scoring happen? Because uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't include a, a, a softmax or a log probability input. So Yeah, that's uh, down, like once we complete the Complete the iterations. Once we have the loop, we score it using the state is. But do you halt, do you halt the loop at the end of the document, or or do you actually explicitly halt it when some condition is met? Uh, so yeah, some condition when some some condition is met. In this case, this is a hyperparameter. 
On what? On the number of the steps that okay. it goes through. Yeah. In your model, the number of steps is not hyperparameter, so it's a blended parameter. In this case, this is hyperparameter. Hyper yeah. Then, as I said, there are based on uh, uh, given different queries, mm -hmm. the number of steps are different. But if you think, you say that the number of steps is, uh, is a hyperparameter, then I don't understand. So, uh, I mean, in intuitively, like, Given a different pair of query and document, uh, we depending on the gate value, we can halt the reading uh, process. The, the but the, still, yeah. in this hyperparameter, and there is another model I'm going to talk about, which implements like hard halting. Yeah, in other it. people from moving to a single model, uh, the, the number of steps is determined dynamically. Mm -hmm. Then trying to even reinforce my model. So you, yeah. you can take probably the final reward if the same stops mm -hmm. that you're supposed to And that is uh, more hard, I mean, hard stopping, hard halting based yes. on from personal learning. But in this case, if you, because those two uh, approaches are trained using end to end back propagation, we did not use any enforcement, we don't want to do scratch decision. So, that's uh, why I had to do this hyperparameter and so that they can be, all the euros can be backpropagated into the beginning of the loop. But uh, we can do hard halting when we test by checking the gating state. We can, of course, we can do that. But when I evaluated, I did not do that, but this is the simple part. But, but when we train it, we actually, have this uh, hyperparameter, number of steps we go. And this is query gating model, and we have this out of the competition version. Now we have this uh, termination head, termination head uh, instead of the gating, right? So this gate gives us the score, probabilistic score for uh, the halting like. Every time step, this give, gives us this uh, score range from zero to one, and these scores are accumulated, and once they reach one, for example, a threshold, it does the hard halting here. I think this uh, model is more similar to what you described using the reinforcement learning, but in this case, we used uh, this head. You have all the reinforcement learning given training. Yeah. Well, we can discuss later. Okay, yeah. So, yep. so this table summarizes the <coughs> results on CB test data set. The first one is human performance, it's around 82. The next models are single models applied to the same task, and those are the ensembles. And this is NSC relations. So overall, the NSC improved the previous result up to 2% accuracy, but the, here the T is the hyperparameter I was talking about, which defines the number of steps in the situation. This T is used in training, Yeah, it's used uh, in training. In, in, in testing, we make hard decision in the, in the second You just second check method. the T. Yeah. Uh, check the, the gating over here. Until past the threshold, you stop. Sorry? Until the, you know, past the threshold, you stop. Was, yeah. it, was that train supervised? Why would this? Why would the system learn how to how to? If, this, if, it, if there wasn't a specific signal, a training type telling it to, to learn how to make this decision, why would you trust that it's going to work? Just naturally. Uh, I mean, like why is run for T steps at, at test time also? I don't know. In, in test time, we don't have T step. But T -step. If, if you always trained it for, why not just make training and, and test time symmetric? Yeah, just make them the same, just make them consistent, right? And do the same. Like, I don't, see, I don't see the advantage of doing one thing, of just always running for 12 steps at training time and then doing something else at test time. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, first uh, reason is we don't want to go to, to the end, until the end of the loop, right? We could just... It's not, that, it's not like that, it's, 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 it doesn't seem like it's that big. Of, like, you know, it's a training time. So that makes no difference. I mean, we could but, run it until the end of the... 
And the, well, it will still be some time. But you don't, you don't think you, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't do any worse, right? Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. They just just uh, keep producing the same results. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah, that's the. What else can? Yeah. 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 Because, you know, the CD is pretty so this is basically oops. So this is basically we can see this as a weak supervision. We are not telling what to read when to stop, but we are forcing the model to stop when it finds the right answer. Can be seen as weak supervision. So it's like if you, why do you expect you know this work? And so but where does the ET go? That like where does how, where, what is being back propagated to ET? ET is embedded in the loss function. It's combined with the cross entropy loss at the last time step. Uh, so so that's defined in the paper, like uh, we can look at that later. Okay. If you look at the paper, that step is defined in the paper, like in separate sections. Okay. Like just <coughs> stretch it just like the recurrent So yeah, this one, one is in the loss function, so it can be back propagated. Okay, so you are actually yeah. And on WD, uh, WD data set, mm. We improved the result by up to like two percent as well. Overall, the the second approach, adaptive competition performs much better than the getting one. So, so uh, relating to the NSC, like if you look at the NSC memory access pattern while it encoding the sentence, we could see this kind of word composition graph, like basically it's learned to compose the words depending on the task. Kind are of real or are they just hypothetical? Are these real? Uh, this is a real example from the language imprints that was it, after training them. And if you look at the step by step, by step visualization, we could see like this. So this one is the uh, memory slot, memory time step zero. And here, and, and every time step, we read the input word and reads this, retrieves this slot and compose them together like this. For example, it's <coughs> quietly composed over here. And then at the last time step, we look at this, we could see this kind of pattern. Like, for example, these function words like on, a, in, they are not accessed at all while being caught in the sentence. But the more like context word or context rich words are composed together to define the sentence encoding, the final sentence vector. And it's learned from the Data. Okay, so at this ends the the sec first part of my talk. And this is the visualization of the, the hidden state of S. Or and this is the visualization of the uh, the memory. The memory. Yeah, actually, this is uh, this uh, highlighted part is the is 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 telling us where the read model attends on. Right, so. so one question regarding this. Do you, can you do the same thing on the output side and generate sentences in this order? Uh, on the, uh, when we are generating, we don't access to the sequence, full sequence, right? So we can't do that. When we are encoding, like for example, machine translation case, we can encode the source. But have you thought about doing something similar on the decoding side as well? Because if, you have this, if you're doing it in multiple steps anyway, so you could be proposing words. And oh, yeah. Right. yeah. But you are doing that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. You, you, you are doing it on the target side for the translation test. Yeah, but we are using the, the source sentence memory. We but, are you're to, you, but you're you allowed to update it with the target. It's a, the, sh the shared part is a feature, right? That you're doing that on purpose. Like, like you're using the shared you're using the shared thing, but you're updating it on the target side at every time. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. But what he is saying is that we could actually encode the source sentence. Like, and then I think that's a good idea, like trying to make the treaty prediction. Like in the first step, we complete the whole memory by generating the sequence. And the second step, we could actually modify the memory, which is like source sentence memory, not the target one. Yeah. <clears throat> so the second part is about learning to learn or meta-learning. This, uh, this talk is about our uh, latest paper, which was submitted to ICML. This year, so we know that there are two major drawbacks of neural networks. So neural networks are data hungry, 
it needs a lot of memory to <coughs> a lot of data to in order to reach reasonable performance. It doesn't support the incremental learning. For example, if we consider machine translation, then we have this predefined vocabulary. And in order to train the model, once the model, the model is built, and when we have new word into coming into the vocabulary, then we have to retrain the model again from the scratch. But the generic intelligence system needs more flexible model. Like we want to train a single model, model and apply it to multiple tasks. Like we want to do the knowledge transfer there, and we need this kind of efficient learning algorithm which can generalize faster using only two or three examples of the same concept. So I'm seeing the meta learning as a solution. Meta learning basically operates in using these two different models. We have this uh, meta level model which acts across the tasks, accumulating the higher level knowledge, and it also teaches the, the, the lower level uh, model uh, how to appear to in the input task, right? So, so we propose the meta networks, or in short, metanet. It has a meta learner and base learner, just like a standard framework. It operates in two different space, meta space and the input task space. So meta space is uh, is defined, like it, it is supposed to be predefined. In our case, we use the loss gradient as meta information. And it, metanet has these uh, different types of weights slow and fast weights. So uh, uh, slow weights are updated using a training algorithm, for example, a back propagation. It could be also you know, real first algorithm. And the fight, fast weights are <coughs> generated by using meta learner. So we have two different types of fast weights. Task level fast weights, which uh, capture the, 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 the task space, right? The, the problem, problem space. And the example label fa uh, fast weights, which is generated pre example base. This is the oral architecture. Uh, we can see that meta learner is equipped with external memory, which stores, temporarily stores the generated weights. And we have base learner over here. The base learner takes in the input. Uh, example and it, it inspects the uh, the input task and gives this meta information, which is loss gradient in, in this paper, in this work. So uh, then by using this uh, meta information, the meta learner generates uh, fast weights, like it parameterizes the base learner and itself to adopt the network to the input new problem. So this is kind of, we can see that these fast weights kind of context dependent and depending on the, on, on, the, on the problem it's operating on or subtask it's operating on, it changes itself so that it can be adapted to the new task. And the output. Uh, what, what is this showing? Is this showing training or test or both? It's, a, it's all related to sure, both. Okay. Okay, so uh, when we so train it, Okay, so input is input is the test example. Input is the test or training example. Okay, right. and then the output is is over here, and the supervision is given from here. It, it's fully differentiable. Goes from here and it differentiates this one and this one as well. So it can be optimized such that it can operate on new tasks. So you then you can use this for I, I used it uh, for one shot learning. For meta learning? For what? Sorry? You say you use this for? For one shot learning? One shot. Yeah. So you're defining a task as being a new class. Not, no. not, not, not a task like, like image recognition versus captioning, but like a task like recognizing a cat versus yeah. a dog. Okay. Yeah. We will talk about that in the result section. I did some, some experiments on it as well, like trying to, to do different types of tasks. Not just the class. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Can I, uh, in this case, slow weights are learned just once, or the meta learner also updates them as well over time? Yeah, it, uh, it updates itself as well. Over slow time. weights as well? Oh, so the, the slow weights as well? Slow, no, slow weights are updated only during the training with training algorithm. 
but it's then fixed. But the only updated parts after Task training, the only updated, yep, again, yep, yep. it's generated again. Pure task base and pure example of this. The task base are never are, are, are parameters. They're they're oh no, they are they're they're there are two pair parameters. They're, they're, but mathematically they're activations, right? They're, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So uh, we integrated this slow weight, slow and fast weights using a layer augmentation method which we proposed. So this we can see that. Each layer has these fast and slow weights. And so the input first goes through the fast and slow weights, and then it goes through nonlinearity, and then they're integrated using vector weights. Addition. This, this is using the test scan? This is what? This is how we integrate them. So Matt is saying the slow weights can uh, stay the same across different uh, yep. This is fast weight is per yep. case. Yep. So after training, slow weights are fixed. This is the these guys uh, refreshed. But you, you're not counting when training. You mean training the background training, not not the one shot. When you're given a new example, a one shot example of a new class, you're not calling that training, right? Yes, uh, I'm not calling that training. Okay, so that's when during the test we assume that we have a single example of one class, and based on that, after seeing that single example, our our network should be able to recognize any examples of the same. class. Same class. Okay, so you're calling all that test time. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so if you look at layer augmented neural network or this layer augmentation approach, it's kind of similar to ResNet. But there are two main differences. Like in ResNet, we have this identity mapping, while in a layer augmented net, we have this fast weight transformation. And then <coughs> We apply the nonlinearity application before the integration, while the ResNet applies it after the integration, right? So those two weights can be seen as like uh, like the weights operating in two different numerical domains. And the reason we apply nonlinearity is that we are kind of normalizing it to a similar domain, like so that they can be integrated. Otherwise, it it, it won't work. It doesn't work like without the nonlinearity. So that's the explanation, and yep. So, uh, so uh, we evaluated the model on one-shot learning tasks. We used the OmniGlot dataset, uh, which is an uh, international alphabet dataset. It contains uh, 1,600 class, and there are two images per class, covering 50 different alphabets of different countries. And uh, there are two splits provided. The first split is is done by some of the Google research, some guys from DeepMind. They used 1,200 for training and 400 for the testing. So this is this class-wise split uh, partitioning. Like we are taking out the, the class uh, for testing. And it's not seen during training. And the second one is actually the standard split provided by the OmniGlot uh, authors. And in, for this split, the alphabet, we think alphabet is forced, which means that this uh, training uh, <coughs> class contains like 30 different alphabets, and this has like 20 different alphabets. So more like, supposed to be more difficult. And we also use the MNIST as like out of domain that uh, kind of very different. Representations. Uh, so uh, for the previous state provided by the, the Google guys, uh, we obtained the state of the art. So there are like baseline models. We have this pixel level nearest neighborhood classifier, CMS network, and memory augmented neural Turing machine. This was appeared at ICM last year. Matching it, it was created NIPS last year. Matching it, this is kind of differentiable nearest neighbor. Like for nearest neighbor matching, they use they parameterize the metric. So basically, those approaches are like metric metric learning approaches. And this is our, our approach. Like we have metanet minus one, which has no uh, task level parameterization in the in the meta learner. So it lacks this dynamic. 
And we have this metanet, which is the standard one that I described, both task level and example level, but the example level for the base learner. And then we, we have this metanet plus, which has like task level parameter for the base learner. Uh, uh, and the, I mean, the base learner has three different parameters now in this, this model. Uh, we have task level, example level, and slow parameters. So now we are integrating three different uh, parameters. What's there between task and example in this case? Like, is, it, is, it, is it one? Is it a task and example? Is it the same thing? Task, task. Uh, in order to formulate the task, uh, I followed the, the previous approach. Like first, we sampled uh, different class, like five different class, for example, in five-way class question, and then I sample an example of those five different. Well, one, example each. one example each. But then, then well, I don't understand what the difference is between class and task. So uh, during the training, uh, during the training, we uh, we uh, simply additional examples for training, like one for the one example for for the one uh, supports it, and the other separate one for the optimizing the parameters. So I sample ten different examples for each class when I train it, but when I test it, I sip, I use the ten different examples. For the prediction, like I mean, for the testing, like now the model is asked to predict the okay. class level. I see. And does any because you didn't you didn't really go into very many details about the um, about the, the net, about how it's actually parameterized. But is are you actually doing any gradient descent at test time, or is it just is it just reading these five things that input and now and now generating? Is there is it, there's there's a network that that reads in these five. Examples of five classes and just generates the weights directly from them, and it was and it was trained the same way. But you're not for the new for the new classes. You're not actually doing mm -hmm. any 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 back propagation. So uh, so the base learner takes in the support set or the the five examples yeah. of five class, and it try to classify it, and we takes the it gives us this loss or in this case cross entropy loss, and using the cross entropy loss we back propagate it. we right, back propagate so, so that we have. Gradient for each parameters, and this gradient is given to the meta learner, and based depending on that gradient, the meta learner parameters back to the base learner. Does that happen at test time? At test time, so yep. Okay. So the test time, both uh, training and test, we used is uh, five class, uh, five examples of five class. So that's the assumption. Well, how many how many updates do you do? How many gradient updates? During the training. During, well, you said it's the same thing in training yes. yesterday. Well, I'm, uh, but for, for, a single, for a single set of five examples, uh, is so it just like a single, a single gradient step, or is it? Or how? Single, single gradient step. Like, so, the, so during the test time, this input goes through the base learner, and we have the loss over here, yeah. and we backpropagate it. But for the slow weights, right? We don't have this one for now. And then it gives us this uh, gradient information. It's provided to the base learner, meta learner, and the meta learner takes in and generates the past parameters, fills in this gap, and then it just classifies it from that. So uh, during the test, we don't update these slow weights, but during the training, we update these slow weights such, such that they, those past parameters make sense for the class question, like okay. for the task. But all, all other approaches like have have. They, they have, like, that's a novel, like, actually using gradient information, because other approaches have tried to generate the weight, but they didn't do it using, they did it just, that's direct parameterization of yeah, the yeah. inputs, where you're actually doing gradient information to, to do it. So there, uh, there is this paper from DeepMind, period at last, uh, NIPS. So those guys use the gradient information, but they try to optimize the network. Like, in this case, the base, the right. slow weights are updated. Yeah. But in, in one-shot learning, yeah. like, it's I, it's very difficult, uh, and there was these people who tried the same thing, but the result was not as good as ours. So okay. instead of optimizing it, which is kind of difficult, given just one example of concept, concept we want to parameterize the network. Well, like those fast weights are generated from the gradient. From the gradient, yeah. So this is kind of relaxed. You can see that a relaxed form of optimization, right? And then, in addition, we have uh, different uh, parameters operating over different time scales, like task level, example level, and slow weights. Does that, do you just make a simplifying assumption during um, 
during grading, during training that you, that they're kind of independent, or do you actually? Yep, that's that's the simplified decision. Okay, yep. so you don't do some sort of crazy move like double no, gradient. Art. No, so uh, we assume that the gradients are independent okay. from each other. So that is a uh, meta learner approach coordinate wise. Okay. Uh, yep, so uh, on this split, uh, we up from the previous results by like two percentage on like 20 way classification, for example. And we can see that this data works well, but in this guy has like three different parameters for the base learner, right? It did not work really well, but we think that uh, something to do with the, the layer augmentation approach. Like using that, like integrating three different parameters in a in a network seems kind of difficult. Like two is fine, so that it can be extended to like number of. So there's like fast one and fast two. Is that what you're saying for the for the third row? There. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are these mean accuracies? Are these mean scores, or are these just one shot, one one run? So yeah, that's a good question. I report the maximum. The the, the maximum on this uh, data set. I report the, the maximum accuracy. I mean, it's not me. Okay, so you just, you ran it a bunch of times, trained it a bunch of times, and took the best I, I'm not really like, <coughs> it actually optimized. Like it actually goes to the the maximum, like this. It actually- but on, this, on the exact same set or on a different split? Uh, it said the class are if, uh, same. Those class are same. Like test class and training class are the same. But the splits are, what kind of split? The tasks are different, possibly, because we are formulating the tasks randomly. So I haven't done one shot learning, but I assume you're going to draw one sample from the test sets for mm -hmm. one of these classes. Mm -hmm. You can get some results. It seems like you can get a completely different result for another test. Uh, no, not that, not that, that doesn't happen. Like, that's, this result is very generic. It's very totally reproducible, like, like as as you advance the training approach, it basically finds this optimal solution, like nowhere to work. Because how, how many, like, how big was, the, how many, how many resamples did you do on, for this guy? For this guy, I did seventeen. During the during the training, I simply ten examples. During the test, I did seventeen examples, which means like there are like twenty examples per. No, but I mean, how test. many? Like, what's the size of the test? Like, what's the effect? Like, how did you do ten thousand resample? Like. This is 97 out of, out of what? Because it's obviously an number of possible subjects. So this, uh, for, this, uh, that is, for this one, I did uh, sampled 400 different tasks. 100? 400 different tasks. Uh, yeah, but those guys, they did not report what they did. So okay. like how these numbers are kind of blurry. Like, okay. So because of that, I also evaluated on the, the, the standard split as well. So this is like they provided like they also did those they have whom they will performance and they have the baseline of baselines over here for hierarchical baseline program this is the current baseline and they also did this is the same protocol same evolution protocol they formed the, the same split they provide the same split and also for in order to use the model they formulated 400 different tasks like that so this is the actual number and we obtained like common level accuracy on it. Did you re-implement those methods or run open source code or? Uh, they have open source code. And did you re-ran them so you're, you're I did not you're run testing. it. I, they, they, so those are published numbers? Yeah, those are the published numbers. And now do you know that your one shot samples match their one shot samples? I don't know, yeah, I don't know that. So how can you make the claim that uh, if you're using different subsets of the one shot values that, that you're, you're your results are better than that. Yeah, that's uh, given that there's like point one percent. Yeah, that's possible, but uh, I I run the experiments like two or three times. I can't run it many times because of the timing and competition. But the, essentially, I will provide the source code. You can just obtain the same result whenever we run it. It just gives us it's pretty, the the range is really low. The range has low range. For sure, yeah. But that's a good question, and yeah, if time allows me, I could run many times and give the average and the variance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, so we also use the MNIST as out-of-domain data. So we only train the module on Omniglot training set, but when we evaluate, we evaluate it on MNIST. So the MNIST representation is not shown to the model at all, but we still expect to perform on that this task. And they also provide the same kind of evaluation. This is based on MNIST test. So uh, the standard architecture gave us the best result on this evaluation, for example. And another interesting evolution is like N-way training and K-way testing. So here we train the model on like five-way class question, 10-way class question, and we test it on like different like five-way, 10-way, 15-way, 20-way class question like that. So the interesting thing is that if you train your model on like 20-way class question task, and then you evaluate it on like five-way class question task, it will give you much higher result than, than the model that was trained on five-way task like you can see the difference over here means means that uh, you want uh, you want to train a model you try to train it on like harder task your model is skilled on a harder harder task it will perform better on better on the simple task it makes like and the similar sense that humans like that for example and uh, when you train on your model on like five way and if you evaluate it on the 20 way then you get this huge performance drop and we also tried this uh, more extreme case, like trained on only 10-way classification task and evaluated on 100-way. It was like around 65. This was like, but just a single run. It's not, it's a preliminary experiment here. And this is the result we obtained from the experiment. So, yep, this concludes the second part. So now I'm going to move to the, the third part of my talk about future research directions. So I would like to work in like four different research directions. And they are not tied to a specific task, but they are relevant to language understanding, of course. So I would like to work towards like knowledge graph as a long-term memory. And then meta learning for like generic, meta learning gives us these uh, solutions uh, solutions to you know, drawbacks of neural networks, so we could actually use meta learner to address these things. And I also would like to continue this computational hypothesis testing approach because it's it's kind of interesting if you think about the process. You can under and also want to work on like language character level language understanding and processing. It's going to be really flexible model if we figure out how to compose the characters for higher level representations. This also relates to. Compositionality, so kind of interesting. So, uh, knowledge graph is long term memory. So, uh, now we see that we have a lot of symbolic knowledge graphs like free based knowledge or like gene or disease ontologies. But then the idea is to learn to use them for different tasks. So, one solution is see them as a knowledge graph because uh, human long term memory basically encodes the those knowledge, right, for long term. So if we, if we actually select, uh, if we actually retrieve the, uh, the knowledge in memory, in short term memory, and then able to use it, it will be really impactful for different tasks. Some ideas over here, like since the knowledge graphs are like, knowledge graphs are huge, I think it's most likely we would combine the symbolic and neural approaches because symbolic approach can scale well neural approaches are flexible to train. And there is this idea of learning differentiable heuristics. It's, a, it's still an abstract idea. And this is the overall, overall you know, framework. Like our main model over here, it takes the input and it retrieves the information from the long-term memory. And it's stored in the short-term memory. Then the short-term memory actually provides the read and the writing like we did in NNC. And whenever we need uh, more information, we will basically learn to query this long-term memory, store it in short-term memory, and use it more expressively, since the short-term short -term memory provides a small chunk of the whole knowledge. So this process could be done iteratively, like in order to reach some specific goal, providing more reasoning. And based on this process, like based on this prior information, we could formulate 
you know, more expressive or more flexible hypothesis for like prediction for the answer. And are you proposing to learn that long-term memory or to just download it from somewhere? This one, long-term yeah. memory? Flash graph would be downloaded from somewhere, or you're going to build it? Download it from somewhere. Because wow. for now, we have enough knowledge graphs. Like, for example, previous, we have like 300 millions of relations over there, triplets over there. Right. And we have gene ontologies, a lot of knowledge there. So the, the thing is that uh, we know this part. We know this part. And this part can be you know, implemented simply. But in this part, we need to figure out how to represent that graph. Like we would, we could have separate, multiple long-term memories. Like we could encode the word net as a memory, and then there is another like different types of so that we would provide provide more like common sense into the machine or things like that. So this is the part we need to figure out how to represent it efficiently, and how to create, and then importantly like how to combine it with this umbilical process because those is like large. We have millions of triples there. So just just the neural approach can scale to that stage. So I think where the symbolic and neural approach meet in order to reach that. So yep. So one question. So what is the representation you're proposing for the long term memory? Are you using just a typical a standard representation like an entity relationship graph or are you thinking about other representations which are differentiable or which yeah. are both so I was, because in graph you have this structure, I was actually starting this experiment by using Transy. Transy is a model that encodes the graph, gives us this representation for each node, right? It also carries out this graph structure as well, and the node representation. So was used, I was, yeah, this, there is this idea using that Transy, but then since we are combining it with the symbolic approach, I mean, that's the necessary part. So I was basically indexing the whole knowledge, also using the characters as well. So basically indexing it and querying it, and learning to query, basically, learning to query the knowledge base and deriving the representation using that node representations. That's the part, something I was working on before this paper, and then I jumped on another idea. Yep. How, how well do you think these things are going to scale when you use an existing uh, graph-based, knowledge database, uh, because if, um, there could be many contradictory interpretations of the data there. I think when we look at these knowledge graphs, we're using our common sense to make sense of the data. But a machine would probably have many different conclusions from the same knowledge graph, sort of the way part of speech tagging, you, you have many different solutions, right? In a sentence, it's just that to us only one makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is uh, when we query that graph and when we store it in, in long-term memory, it does not have to be really accurate, but it, this information should be sufficient to operate on. So this part, in this part, the model actually should be learned to make sense of that representations. So, so another, I think that's... Another, another slight like, variant of that question is uh, in the, the long-term memory, the representation, uh, does it also uh, handle uncertainty? Uh, yeah, that's a good part. So if we uh, index it and if we use symbolic approaches, we won't. It could not because we are basically using the surface features like like searching, like text search, for example. But the idea is to. Uh, to have high recalling on it. Like when we search through the indexer, our search should provide high recall so that we have sufficient information in the short term memory. But still, it's a small chunk of that. Instead of operating on the that huge, we would still, we could operate on that small chunk. But it should have high recall. So, and then this part is trainable, right? This part, we can train it to operate on that certainty or uncertainty parts. What I mean more, more is like, uh, you ask a question like, uh, how long does it take to boil an egg, right? right? If, if, if you ask that of uh, a, a chatbot, it might say three seconds, right? 
Yeah. Uh, I know that's a valid answer. Now, if you use your knowledge graph, then presumably you're going to figure out that you should be boiling it for three minutes or whatever, right? But what if that knowledge is not directly in inside the knowledge graph, but you have to make a few hops before you conclude that? In that case, you can have many different paths, and you can still conclude something totally ridiculous, uh, and, and even justify it. An egg okay. is comes from a bird. The bird needs to be cooked in an oven for three hours, right? Yeah. So three hours. Yeah. And you can have many, many different answers like this. Just like as I was saying, in part of speech tagging, you have many different answers. They're all valid in terms of the syntax, but you have to use common sense to figure out which one works. Yeah. So is the knowledge graph really going to help? Yeah. So the good thing about this approach is that we can have different types of uh, graphs, uh, different types of information encoded in that. For example, if you look at WordNet, it has this like common sense information, like relationship between the objects. So, yeah, so if it's going to be sparse, that it it, it's going to be sparse. sparse. As long as you have to make more than a few hops to this network, there might be too many solutions. I, I don't know that for sure, but it may be too many solutions. Yeah, and and you may actually have to do something other than this and just have this entity kind of learn from its experience and build its own knowledge that makes sense in its own existence, more limited than looking at the entire knowledge graph because the entire knowledge graph is really just a sparse subset of, of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. and it's deceptively complete because when we look at it, we see things that are actually not in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's true. But... Yeah. So for this one, knowledge graphs are the resource for now we have, right? Encoding the common sense or the relationship between the objects. We could. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying this is the wrong way to go. I'm just wondering, since this is future research, I'm wondering what do you think are going to be yeah. the caveats as well? Not just, you know, what might work out or what might not work out. Right, I think I will think more about what you said, but this is like what I am proposing to do. But no, at least we have these knowledge graphs and a lot of knowledge representation. And for sure now we have this nice high accuracy information extractor system. So why not we just try to learn to use it <laughs> for different purposes? So it's an idea. All right, so. So there is another direction to work on meta learning. So we know that neural networks are not enough for generic artificial intelligence because, for example, neural networks are, models are static. So, for example, in, in machine translation case, we have this fixed vocabulary, or knowledge base and ontology linking. We have these fixed entities. In chat, what we have fixed vocabulary, right? But in world, is dynamic. Like, for example, when we have new world comes in coming into the vocabulary, then we have to start the training or the model from the scratch. And the neural networks can't handle the domain difference, for sure. Like, when you train on, on a, like, a uh, named entity target on newsware domain and you want to apply it to, like, biomedical or clinical domain, your model won't work because of that domain drift. And your model should be able to, you know, adapt itself to that difference, depending on the input, like, depending on the input context. And, the other thing is neural networking is a lot of data. So how about the lower resource domain problems like clinical but biomedical domains? Or how about lower resource language understanding, like for example, like Mongolian language? In, in this case, we don't have a lot of resource in there. So should be able to transfer the knowledge between the languages or right? So the thing is that any artificial intelligence is more flexible model than neural networks that can capture the dynamics, dynamic, the world dynamic. So promising direction is meta learning or meta networks, meta networks we proposed in our last paper. So the thing is that the nice thing about it is that it's really flexible depending on like, like for example, if you consider about a machine translation system, when we see a new word, then we want to tailor our model to, learn, to, to be able to translate it, then we just provide the pair of translation, like two or three of pair of translation, including that new word, just introduce it to the model. It should be able to just pick up it and apply and translate. 
you don't have to learn it from the scratch. Or even, even ontology linking or like knowledge-based construction, same like entities are always being introduced. New companies like always, new startups are always being constructed like this. So, so this is dynamic, dynamic style, but uh, whenever a new, com new entity comes in, we does not want to train our model from the scratch, but we just provide two or three couple of examples and then tell the model so it can be just pick up on the fly and fly it, provide it. So there are some extensions I'm planning to do for like meta networks. So if uh, we parameterize like recurrent neural networks, it will allow us for various language and SQL modeling tasks. And it can be extended to discover its own augmentation scheme. So like the layer augmentation scheme we proposed here is kind of an instance of it. And in the long term run, it would be interesting to ask like, what could be the meta information that is more robust and you can extract? And as I said, it will allow many useful applications. So the, there are other two directions, kind of direction I would like to work on. Reasoning, like the computational hypothesis testing approach uh, proposed in the, in the paper, like, like this guy has this uh, generative process in it, like we are generating the hypothesis for the right answer. So if we plug in like generative models in it, then it can actually generate this imagination in the picture in it, like if conditioning on the input. So actually by generating that, we can iteratively improve it reach, in order to reach the, the, the right answer, the final answer. So where I think the generative models meet the reasoning, so it can be just plugged in and work together. Those are the like abstract ideas, but yeah, some directions I would like to work on. And character level language processing, because it's a flexible, and we don't need to worry about the words or things like that. Importantly, we would also learn to compose things like and compose and come up with abstract representations if we work on it like. So thank you very much. Yep. So one of the things that you said was a that you believe was a big advantage over uh, neural uh, Turing machines was that you use the same weights for the up, for the read and write. Mm -hmm. Do you think that for very large scale tasks it, that would still hold? Do you think that like do you think that tying them together is, is is a regularizer, or do you think that even for large scale tasks it's better to tie them together? Like you've already had millions of, of examples. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, tying them together actually helps. Improve. I mean, it's it's a good solution for language processing. But only I think, as far as I know, it's it's a good solution for the, if you want to apply it in language task. It's, it can be tied together because we are composing different words together, right? But for like program induction tasks or things like that, I'm really not sure if they can be you know tied. But, for, but even for language, if using a shared source and target uh, memory. Accessing a particular source, like like if you're accessing a, some source word, that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to overwrite that same word at that exact time step. Because you might still that that word might still be useful, like the, the stuff that was in that memory might still be useful later on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I, uh, it, it's not clear to me that that for language, it's it's always going to be useful to overwrite the memory that you just read because you might in some cases you might you might want to like if you're using verb. If you, if you have to translate a, a, a subject and an object, they both have to agree with the verb, then you might want to access that verb twice. And so as soon as you translate the subject, you don't want to necessarily overwrite the verb because, um, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 I see your point. Uh, yep, that's true. And that's why we have this uh, this theme over here. I'm trying to remember that. Sequentially. Okay, so you're saying it could it could just learn to rewrite the same thing that it, it just if it wanted to store that same thing, it could just put it back in that in that vector and, and then store it back. Yeah, and yeah, it's really like uh, this reading part, read writing part is part is really like tailored for language processing, encoding the sequence particularly. So possibly there are there could different approaches, but still like. We have this neural tree machine, which 
use ZZ plus it meets the other one and then mix them together to write, right? That's what you are saying. So well, yeah, I'm saying if you had a very large amount of data, whether it would be better to, whether this is more acting as a regularizer or whether it's actually a better technique even for large data. What kind of data? Like, like for large scale translation where you had like, where you had like hundreds of millions of training words. Because you did a small scale machine translation test, right? Thinking of like, like, a, like you know, some like four hundred million, like the other tasks that people are working on, uh -huh. like four hundred yeah. million words of training. Whether whether having tied weights would still be better than having separate weights. Yeah, way. for like synthesis encoding, for sure, because it can also act as as a gating mechanism as well. Like if you look at this, so this is is kind of gating mechanism as well. Like we are trying to get the 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 long term the the information we read. In the past, just to the output. So it's, it's a useful question, I think. Yeah. All we have is now for now like this result, those results, and then initiative explanation. But I don't have really nice <laughs> theory about it. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, actually, I was wondering, did you compare uh, neural Turing machines with semantic encoders? Uh, I was uh, wondering, did you try these semantic encoders of programming tasks, like no. sorting, or, or uh, these are not expressible in this uh, architecture? Or in, in principle, it can also do sorting, right? given enough. Uh, can it learn how to sort? I don't think it can do that. I'm not but sure. The, I, don't, I don't see what it seems Why? like. This is strictly more powerful than neural Turing machines, or almost strictly like, uh, like other than the, the, the different. Uh, so I, I I'm not sure what's required for sorting, like what kind of model express news. Like but I mean, this is, this is basically more powerful than neural Turing machines, right? Other than the fact that you're using the same update vector. It should, so it should be able to do anything that neural Turing machines can do, right? It's, 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 it's like a neural Turing machine, but with extra stuff. Extra stuff, yeah. But, but, but here you don't, uh, but here uh, the, thing is that the limitation is you cannot read and write from multiple spaces. Uh, right, so that, that's what I'm saying. So the, only, so the only real, the only thing that's, that, that the only limitation is that you're, is that you're tying the... The, the weights have dates together so that there is no information, information condition. Basically, kind of relaxing on it, like relaxing on the right way. Thing. Yeah, I mean, of course, these read, compose, and writes are really useful in, in program induction. Right? right so, so it's compose, for example, composing the two root mode or things like that. But still, <coughs> I mean, if I would apply anything as it is, it's kind of difficult, I think, because we have this way tying. NC. I'm, I'm not sure, but... And during machines also have, I think, a couple of addressing mechanisms. One is index-based, the other is also content-based, so they can actually search for particular value. Yeah. Yeah. So that is also uh, uh, somehow expensive. Location based. Yeah. That, that what you are saying is location-based, right? Yeah, two, yeah, right. Yeah, location-based and content-based. Content-based is basically soft attention. And then hard attention, that is the location-based one. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I don't think that's beneficial, really, to a machine. That actually introduced more that's complexity. It's possible in this architecture. Um, like, so I mean, the model could learn how to do, how to do location based with, with so content based. The general observation right, is that right, right. memory is good, having memory is good, but then uh, when we use it, we also introduce this additional complexity. And then we have task problem, like problem we have on. We want to solve the task, mm -hmm. but then having memory introduce another problem. Like for example, in case of neural Turing machine, he introduced this ad additional complexity, and then now your controller, for example, has to learn to solve that task, as well as access to that the manipulated memory, which becomes kind of difficult at the same time. So that like having this kind of simple methods, like for example, here we just tie the read write, we basically get rid of some of the complexities. Overhead. Uh, so, yeah, so maybe we'll discuss it after, but the idea is if you simplify it, the expressivity is still the same as NTN, right? You're not losing anything on expressivity at least. Is, uh, that, is that like. Uh, to compare with case? NTM, we don't, what we are losing is we don't have hard attention or location based data thing. But you said you can do it with attention, right? Uh, with, with, with attention, yeah, that's uh, a content based data thing. 
But hard attention here is location-based addressing, like what kind of location you want to address, which is more. Uh, but I'm not sure it's how useful this hard attention is. Well, how how do you initialize the, the memory in your in your case? Initialize with the word vectors. Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, I see. So. So, when you have like sentence consisting of ten words, then you have ten word vectors. In the okay, so you do it on the source side, and then like for the translation task, you you don't you just keep you to say memory. So you initialize it with the source vectors. Yeah. That's like the okay. Embedding vectors. Yeah. Okay, Embedding nice. vectors can be also trained. So, right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we'll discuss it more after. Thank you.